Let us discuss timing synchronization in detail now, also known as clock synchronization, clock recovery or timing recovery. Consider a binary pulse amplitude modulation system where the signal is arriving at the receiver in the form of an analog waveform. The original signal consists of minus 1 and plus 1 which we can locate here minus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 minus 1 and plus 1. When the signal is at the receiver side, the ADC, the analog to digital converter at the receiver has to blindly sample the continuous waveform. In this example, we have L equals 2 samples per symbol and you can see that there is no way for the receiver to know in advance where the optimal samples would lie that correspond to the actual modulation symbols. And there is always a timing phase offset between the actual location of the modulation symbols and the sampled waveform. In this example, we have a lucky case where exactly at the symbol boundaries, the ADC has been sampling the analog waveform and we don't have to do anything else. Since this does not happen in practice, we focus our attention on recovering this timing phase offset from the received signal itself. From the perspective of a receiver, the signal is delayed. Hence, there is a timing phase offset between the peak of the pulse and the actual location where the ADC has sampled the waveform, which is called timing offset. So usually we say that the timing offset lies between minus 0.5 symbol time to plus 0.5 symbol time. And in normalized terms, we say it is from minus 0.5 to 0.5. Let us see what the effect of timing mismatch is on the received signal. We take a simple example with L is equal to four samples per symbol and just three different symbols in succession. So this is the current symbol, this is the future symbol, this is the past symbol. And assume that there is an offset of 0.25 TM, which means that for four samples per symbol, four multiplied by 0.25, we have a difference of one sample. In an ideal case, we, the receiver should have sampled here, here, and here. In this non-ideal case, when the receiver is sampling one sample before the actual point, you can see that the contribution from the previous symbol, which would have been zero in the ideal sampling case, is not zero. Similarly, the contribution from the next symbol, which would have been zero for an ideal timing instant, is not zero. These values are then added to this value for our current resultant cumulative sample. Not only that this inter-symbol interference is arriving from the two symbols and from the symbols even before that and after that, but the actual amplitude has also reduced. This is a little demonstration of the effect of timing offset on the downsampled match filter outputs. This is the excess bandwidth variable which is chosen as 0.5. The samples per symbol are 16 and the sample rate is 16,000. The timing offset in this case, because it's a root raise cosine filter, there is no timing offset here. And after the base generation, the input is given to a QAM baseband block, which we have made ourselves. And its output is given to a match filter, which is a root raise cosine filter. And Notice that I haven't chosen any decimation factor here. This is because I want to choose the sample at which I decimate by myself. Otherwise, I could have chosen samples per symbol as a decimation factor here, the sample which eventually maps to the symbol decision. Here is the skip head block where we are introducing the timing offset. And this is the down sampler where we are throwing per sim minus one samples out of every sample sim samples in this case 15 out of every 16 samples are being thrown let us run and check the output of this low graph this is the qam waveform after the match filter both i and q arms are visible here the down sampled symbols 
are perfectly mapped to the positive and negative values and the scatter plot is clearly seen to be at the desired places let us change the timing offset to 2 so we are introducing a timing offset of one sample after running the flow graph we can see that there is a cloud which appears here where does this cloud come from as explained in the lecture each symbol is now interfering with the front and back symbols this is why this cloud appears this interference is due to the symbols which are coming before and after the desired symbols so that is why we can see that the cloud has grown with the timing offset if we introduce a larger timing offset you will see that the cloud size has grown more we can see that now there is a lot of inter symbol interference present so this is the effect of the timing offset and this is why we need to figure out which sample out of all these corresponds to our symbol decision the job of the simple timing synchronization scheme is to locate the sample out of all these which correspond to the actual transmitted symbol if you have understood the effect of timing mismatch in time domain in the previous slide you are free to skip this and the next slide which explain the effect of timing mismatch in frequency domain at two samples per symbol the spectral aliases are well separated from one another and no timing offset harms our signal however the decisions are on one sample per symbol and we need to downsample the signal to symbol rate when we do that there is aliasing as long as the timing is right these aliases they add up to produce a flat spectrum this flat spectrum is the frequency domain condition for Nyquist no ISI criterion and no inter symbol interference occurs however when the timing is not right the aliases result in dips in these regions and in an extreme case we even can have a spectral null at these frequencies of 1 over 2 tm and minus 1 over 2 tm we again seek help for our old friend the shift in one domain is multiplication by complex sinusoid in the other domain remember that we said that if we have to shift the carrier frequency of a signal we multiply it with a complex sinusoid through a local oscillator to shift that frequency similarly when we shift in time domain we have a multiplication by complex sinusoid in frequency domain it's a very similar principle so the complex sinusoid rotates these parts of spectrum of our signal in this direction and these ones in the other direction now this is a spectral alias so this is a representation of what we have here the result is that this is rotating in one dimension direction this is rotating in the other direction and you can see here we can have a spectral null as far as timing synchronization is concerned we can utilize data edits techniques in which known symbols are sent in the form of a training sequence or non data edit techniques in which the receiver has to blindly estimate the timing offset from unknown modulation symbols feed forward methods produce a one shot timing estimate while the feedback techniques seek help from a closed loop structure like a phase lock loop in this context we call it a timing lock loop how to compensate the timing error as far as the carrier error is concerned we just have to produce a complex multiplication to compensate for this carrier error on the other hand a timing error implies that we needed to sample at this point representing a plus one but we had a sample at this instant so the compensation is done through the help of interpolation what we do is that we take the relevant sample and its neighbors and use a mathematical formula to produce this estimate out of one two three four or more neighboring samples we will not cover interpolation in these lectures because this is a purely mathematical technique and there are several methods available which can be seen in any helpful reference 
Finally, in, in these lectures, we will focus on pulse amplitude modulation. Timing synchronization on quadrature amplitude modulation is very similar and we just need to add the timing error from the I and Q arms. Our first timing estimator is a feed forward solution and it is called brute force estimator. So we apply the correlation principle. By now we are very familiar with what correlation does. Here we have the match filter output sampled at wrong times. The first thing we do is we remove the effect of modulation. So these are known symbols and we have seen on, in the lecture on carrier phase synchronization how this multiplication removes the effect of the modulation symbols from the match filter output. No conjugate is needed because we are discussing pulse amplitude modulation. Just like we saw before, we can have a serial implementation or we can have a parallel implementation. In parallel implementation, we have a set of match filter all shifted by a different timing offset. And we filter the input signal with all of these matched filters. After downsampling and removing the effect of modulation, we will see which branch produces the maximum amount of correlation and corresponding timing offset gives us the estimate. In a serial implementation, we have a match filter for which we keep shifting the timing offset and we stop when we find the maximum correlation out of those. As you can see, the brute force estimator is computationally very complex and we need to find simpler techniques 